the Teach Pitch podcast. We are very excited to be launching a series of interviews for Teach Pitch, a global community of 50,000 subscribers from over 205 countries to date. And for these interviews, we have selected a number of subscribers who have achieved great things. And by great, I mean amazing. Think of former presidents, entrepreneurs, people who've built hospitals, huge nonprofit organizations, successful journalists, doctors, etc. And what all our guests have in common is that despite their great success, they've encountered many enormous challenges. So what were these challenges and how did they overcome them? That's what we're going to be talking about here. My name is Aldo de Pap and I'm massively looking forward and very grateful you can join us on this journey. So sit back, relax and download the podcast here. People who visit our house will be seeing me sitting with the boys, with this teacher, with this male teacher, and people would be shocked and say, oh! and usually go to my mother and say, how can you allow your daughter to be sitting with the boys? We just saw her learning to read and write with the boys. And this was seen as me doing something bad. This interview with Edna Adan looks into her personal challenges of growing up as a girl in the British protectorate of Somaliland, a nation where education was not available for the female gender. We also discuss how she dealt with the challenge about her career choice of becoming a nurse, something that was frowned upon being the daughter of a medical doctor. Enjoy this interview with Edna Adan. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm very happy to be here in our third episode of this specific season. And today is a, it's a very special episode because I have with me Edna Adan. And uh, when discussing how I'd best introduce Edna Adan, she told me just a few minutes ago, don't spend too much time in explaining who I am, because at the end of the day, it is about what we do. Our actions are what matters. And I think that is the best way to introduce someone like Edna Adan, because her entire life is actions. She is a very impressive person based in Somaliland. If you go through her life, uh, there are so many amazing components. It would merit a separate podcast just to describe uh, the diversity and the talent of someone like Edna Adan. So for the sake of this podcast and because I want to speak to Edna as soon as possible, I will keep it light. Edna Adan is a nurse, the builder of a hospital, a former first lady, uh, a former minister, an author, a great advocate of the republic that she lives in, a spokesperson, uh, so many things uh, that come all together. And it's very rare uh, that we get to speak to someone who has brought so many things together and in a, such a successful manner. Um, it is a great honor to have Edna uh, Adan here. I'm not going to go too elaborate in the further introduction of Edna Adan, but I am going to read very shortly a, a small snippet of an article that was written about Edna Adan in 2012 that appeared in the Huffington Post, uh, which is called The Muslim Mother Teresa. And here is basically how Edna Adan is introduced there. Who is Edna Adan? The short answer, she's a nurse midwife, founder of a hospital bearing her name, who's saving and changing the lives of tens of thousands of people in Somaliland, a place not even recognized as a country. She's also a Muslim. Edna is as tough as General Petraeus, as compassionate as the Pope, as tireless as Michael Phelps, as beautiful as Tina Turner, and has a get-it-done-no-excuses-worth ethic to rival Bill Gates. I would not want to be on Edna's bad side. Well, I think that is a beautiful <laughs> introduction, at least an introduction that raises lots of curiosity. Edna, a very, very warm welcome to you. Thank you so much uh, for joining us in this podcast. Well, thank you very much, Aldo. It's a, it's a great pleasure and a privilege to be speaking to you. 
Thank you very much for introducing me to the world. And thank you also for your interest in education, because education is that glue, that cement, that helps us to build the future. And um, well, thank you for that introduction. I feel very humbled and I feel very embarrassed. But it's not what I have been or what I am doing now. It's what we can do and what we should be doing together uh, to make this troubled world a better place for all humanity and a better place for those who need a better place and who do not have a good place at the moment. It's the poor, it's the uneducated, it's the weak, it's the sick. Because mm. anybody who is not affected by these afflictions has choices, has resources, has options. But there are many, many who do not have the options that you and I and many of us have had. And I think this is what we need to see how we can address some of these problems. We cannot change the world. I know I'm, I'm a realist at the end of the day. Mm. But a little bit at a time, we can make a difference. And education is the basis, is the tool that we need to enhance, to improve, and to use to make the changes that we're all looking for. So thank you very much for inviting me to this meeting. Well, you're very welcome, uh, Edna. And, and that brings me basically to my first question. You have a, a, you know, a life full of helping and looking at other people. Looking at the situation today versus when you started as a nurse, how would you assess where we are today? Do you feel we are in a better scenario than we were, let's say, 30 years ago? Or would you say that basically not too many things have changed? Oh, I, I think many things have changed. I mean, the fact that we're speaking online itself uh, is a major achievement. It's something that we did not have. But I think I need to take the clock back not only uh, 30 years. I'm 83, by the way. I, I'm pushing 83. I, if God gives me time and life, uh, by September I should be 83. Born in former British Somaliland Protectorate. At a time when there were no schools for girls. Um, to be able to read and write, to learn, to decipher the mystery of the alphabet. Boys were going to school, but girls were not allowed to go to school. But since my father was a doctor, we had books, we had magazines, we had things, papers in our house, which I didn't know what they contained. I could look at the pictures, but I didn't know what those black and white, black scribbles on the white paper were. And it was thanks to my father, who had that initiative. By the way, he was someone who was a great role model to me, and he still is. He's been gone for many, many years. But I still look up to him for having been the person that he has been, a compassionate, generous, uh, and dedicated man uh, who loved people and who was loved by all, and who was known as the father of health care. So I grew up in a house when people were always needing my father, needing his attention, needing support from him. And there were boys in our neighborhood who lived in houses that were not as comfortable as ours was, and we had spare uh, space. So my father turned the veranda in my house, in our house, into a makeshift school where he put a blackboard, acquired some chalk or whatever, and hired a teacher to come in the afternoons to teach the boys in our neighborhood, do a revision of their, of their lessons, and help them with their homework. Mm -hmm. So when this teacher would come to my house, and the little boys I played with came to our house to be taught something, I was an inquisitive little girl. So whatever they learned, I learned. And although I didn't go to school with them in the morning, whatever I learned in the afternoon, I caught up and I learned with them. And soon I would find books in my father's house and I would turn the pages and 
if we had been taught a particular letter that day, let's say the letter A or the letter B, I would look at the pages, the written things in my dad's books, and I would find the letter A and the B and the letter that we had. And this solved the mystery of the alphabet for me. And soon I could, I could put those letters together and put a C and an A and a T together. Oh, cat, cat, like my cat. So I could mm. write cat. I could write my name. I could. So these are the building blocks with which I started. I was hungry for knowledge. I was soaking it up because the boys had mornings and afternoons. I only had the afternoons. So I needed to compete with them. And I was the only girl. And I didn't want the boys to think that girls could not learn. And I just wanted to be as good as they were. So that was what the motivation I had as a child. It took years. It took until 1953 when the very first school was opened for girls in British Somaliland Protectorate. Incredible. When we asked you about the challenges you've encountered, because we have basically this podcast is about challenges and how you overcame them, number one is that you wrote down was being a girl. And you're already kind of, you know, referring to the first challenge, I can imagine, that it took up until 1953 for a school to open so you could have an education. Is that correct? Absolutely right. And, of course, between... The years in the 40s, uh, in the mid-40s, just after the Second World War, or maybe during the Second World War, these were the years when I was learning to read and write in, my, in our veranda uh, at age seven or six and a half, seven, eight. And people would come to my mother, because the boys would, would yeah, you know, say they went to school and that I was with them, and the news would be known by you know, the people who work in my house or the, pe- you know, the people who visit our house would be seeing me sitting with the boys, with this teacher, with this male teacher, and people would be shocked and say, oh! and usually go to my mother and say, how can you allow your daughter to be sitting with the boys? We just saw her learning to read and write with the boys. And this was seen as me doing something bad. Hmm. Luckily, in neighboring Djibouti, French Somaliland, La Côte Française de Somali, which is right next door to Somaliland, Girls and boys went to school. And my mother's sister was a school teacher. Mm. And soon, after a year or two in my veranda, the discussion was, what should we do with a girl? She's learning to read and write. And then, of course, my, my learning went beyond my veranda. Every occasion I had, since I deciphered the alphabet, I was putting words together and making things and and seeing how it sounds. And so my parents allowed me, decided to send me to school, to Djibouti, and French became my first foreign language. And I formally went to a school, sat in a class with boys and girls, and had lessons from teachers in an equal um, manner. We would talk with the boys, we had our homework with the boys, we had our strengths, our weaknesses, and... But, of course, I was challenged because everything was in French. And the little foreign language I knew was English. And French was a totally new language to me. So I had to overcome that and learn the language fast enough to understand what the French nuns, because there were Franciscan nuns who were running that school, were explaining. Uh, So these are the challenges. Now, I'm, I'm giving a long story to try and bring you up to where we are today. This went on, 1953, first school was opened. By then, I had finished primary education in Djibouti. I was 14, and I was conscripted to becoming an assistant teacher to help the British teachers in the first girls' school, to help the female teachers teach the girls and also receive a secondary school from them. So I taught in the mornings for the teachers, or helped them teach, and learn how they were teaching, understanding the frustrations of the girls, because they were being taught, which that was foreign to them, the same way I had been taught in French, a language that was foreign to me at that time. Mm -hmm. And two years 
after that, you know, experience in, in Borao, in the first girls' school, I learned enough English, enough second school, and the British kindly allowed me to sit for an examination that would qualify successful candidates to win a scholarship and go to Britain. The only thing was, until then, only boys went to school, and I was the first girl who was allowed to sit for this examination. Thankfully, I passed, and I won a scholarship. That sent me to England in 1954, learned to become a nurse, learned to become a midwife, learned to run a hospital, learned so many things beyond nursing, and, and, and uh, saw a, big, a much bigger world than, than the world that I was born in, Somaliland. And, of course, my father would come and visit England, when I was there, he visited about three times during the seven years that I was there. I visited twice during the seven years that I was there. And each time on holiday, I would go to work like that, go to the hospital, and see the difference between the hospitals where I was working, where I was being trained, and the ones my father was working in. And, and I'm quickly going yeah. back to the fact that you were the first, because... I think that is a little bit of a pattern when reading your bio and, and listening that in many ways, intentional or non-intentional, you were the first. Yeah? You were also the first female minister of foreign affairs in Somaliland. And then you're also the first one to build a hospital, you know, on, on such a scale, on such a level, helping so many people. There's also the fact that in 1961, when I came back from England, I was able to drive a car. I'd learned to drive a car in, in, in Exactly, yeah. In fact, I'm going to remember a very sentimental, well, I'm going to share with you something that I, I, the reason why I learned to drive. I love driving. My dad had a car and I, he would always, sometimes allow me to hold the steering wheel. But I came back from a holiday with a Dutch friend who was a trainee with me. And when we went to Holland, had a holiday with them, with, with, with Annika's family in Krimpenandelek, in Holland, not more from Amsterdam. Um, Annika's sister had a car, and her father, Annika's father, was the male. So he had cars. His wife had a car. Her sister, Annika's sister, had a car. But Annika and I did not know how to drive, and we depended on public transport and bicycles. So when we came back from the holiday, we saved up enough money, and Annika and I took driving lessons. Uh, so that, that was the introduction to my learning to drive in 1959. So by the time my father would come and visit me, I had learned to drive, and I would show him how I could drive. By then, a friend had bought an old second-hand Austin Morris or something. Mm -hmm. When I came back to Somaliland in 1961 as the first qualified nurse midwife that my country had ever had, I started to offer my services to my country because I was trained to work for my country, the British had left, Somaliland had become independent from Britain, through some crazy idea we united with neighboring Italian Somalia, and we're still conjunct twins that are so difficult to live with, I um, began to drive, and I would be stopped by the police, because I did not have a driving license. And of course I said, yes, I do, I, I, this is my license, this is what allowed me to drive in England, when there were millions and thousands of cars, and here with, you know, 10 donkey cars and 20, you know, goats and maybe five cars, you don't want me to drive. And they would go to my father and, and complain that my father had allowed me to drive when girls were not allowed to drive cars. And luckily, my father would say, well, go and talk to her. My, my daughter is competent. I wouldn't give her my car if she were not a safe driver. Give her a test. Test her out. I said, but we can't, because women are not allowed to drive. She says, well, she drives. That's how I was allowed. It took, it took them six months to come to a conclusion that, you know, I was not giving up, so they allowed me. They tested me. I passed, of course. And they gave me the very first license they gave to a woman. And that was not only my first obstacle. My obstacle was I was not recruited by the government of that country, of Somalia, because it was the government of Somalia at that time, Somaliland had joined with neighboring Somalia, I did not have a contract. I was working in the hospital, working harder than everybody else, 
being called at night for emergencies. We started to train midwives, trying to change the quality of care, but I did not have a salary. People would go to the, at the end of the month to the office and they would pick up their salary. And month after month, I would go to the office and say, by the way, uh, do I have a salary? Has my salary come in? And they would look at the list and say, no, your name is not on there. Sorry. It took 22 months for me to get a salary. Wow. And I refused to leave. I refused to leave. I, my, I was living with my family, so I didn't need any money. Um, but I needed the title for the position, the responsibility that I was holding. I was running all the female wards. There was only one doctor in the entire hospital. I was running day and night, and yet, because I was a woman, they did not allow me to get a contract in the position that I deserved to have. Because if I had been the cleaner, there was a job, there was a title, there was a salary. If I had been the cook, there was a salary. If I had been the woman who cleans the floor, there was a salary. But a senior graduate nurse midwife who is female was a totally new species. Mm -hmm. So you overcame the yes. challenge, Edna, basically, by not not quitting, not stopping, not quitting. continuing. Not yeah. quitting. Not quitting. And they, they would have loved it. And, and they would come to me and say, why do you work? Why, why do you don't need money? Your father's, you know, has got this and that. So this was our, you know, ping pong words. But at the end of the, at the, end of the month, I still had no salary. I said, okay, one more month. I'm here. I'm not going anywhere. I'm going to be here. 22 months later, they eventually said, oh, oh, let's just do it. They signed it, of course. They're very smart. They didn't sign it from the day I started the work. They started my salary from the day they signed it. But I won. And women got into the civil service, into the senior mm -hmm. civil service. Uh, I bought my own uniform. You know, I took care of my, my living, my home, my family, my, you know, whatever I needed, my family provided. But I could hold on, and I felt if I give in now, if I allow that door to be closed to women, it will remain closed to women forever. I can keep my foot in that door. I can hold on for as long as they can hold on. It took 22 months, and but at the end of the day, we won. Schools were open, nursing training started, women got into the civil service. Then, of course, politics got in, civil war. 1982 to 1991, Somaliland was at war with Somalia. Somaliland got destroyed. Everything that Somaliland had built, anything that it inherited from Britain, anything that we had worked on, public services, hospitals, schools, homes, everything got destroyed, got bombed by the army of Somalia. 95% of our country got destroyed. Now, in 1991, when Somaliland separated from Somalia, that is when Somaliland of today started to rebuild. Mm -hmm. By then, I had been, you know, first lady, this and that, joined the UN, was a very senior UN diplomat, lived abroad. Where during the Civil War, I was working for the UN. And in 91, I was transferred by WHO to Djibouti, the country where I went to school, and right next door to my country that had been leveled to the ground. I was close to being retired, and in 91 I began to visit my country for the first time in many years. I was shocked at the level of destruction. A quarter of a million of our people were killed. One million of our people were in refugee camps in Ethiopia. 50,000 people just in the city of Hargeis alone were killed. Every building that we remembered, homes, hospitals, schools that were there before, were level to the ground. Land was covered with landmines, no water, no light, no electricity, no security, no no law, no order, just militia running around, people going around with, with chains of bullets uh, and guns on their shoulders. Yes, they're the ones who liberated the country, but this was not a place where people like that should be running around in a civilian environment. And that brought back to me a lifelong desire that I had always had to build a hospital, 
to build the kind of hospital my father would have liked to work in. And in mm. fact, I started building one in Somalia, but that also got taken by Somalia. So that's lost. So as I got closer to retirement, I um, was flying in and out from Djibouti to Algeza because I was also given responsibilities here. I speak the language. It's my country. I could do a lot of PR for the UN, smooth things out, help them establish things. And the first thing I did was rebuild our house. Demined it, first of all, put the landmines out. This is your parents' house, your old yeah. parents' house. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. The house we grew in, the house we loved, the house. Yeah. I want to have our house back. And my father has died, and I'm the eldest in my family, and it's my responsibility. Uh, and I want to build that house back to its, you know, honor. And so I bought my freedom. Freedom to do whatever time, whatever resources God gives me from then on to devote it to my lifelong passion. Building a hospital. Hmm. Build a hospital. But who's going to work in it? Health work is killed. So we have to train people. And who do we need to train? Women. I need nurses. I need midwives. Where am I going to find nurses and midwives? And the people who could read and write, who I could train. In 97, when I retired and came back to my country, some other land, were the little girls who had been taught to read and write on sand in refugee camps in Ethiopia. No blackboards, no, no. Mm -hmm. These are girls who I had, who I recruited, 300 applied. I took the top 42 and started training them. And I count my blessings every day. That one of the girls I trained there is today the dean of the School of Nursing and Midwifery of my university. Two wow. of them are medical doctors, and one of those medical doctors is a surgeon who was right here this morning sitting in front of me in my, my desk trying to see how we can get the, because people, because of this coronavirus, transportation is interrupted, people cannot come and travel between, you know, it, it, we had so many problems before and corona has just made things worse. And we're trying to find how to get the people in Togwajale, to come here and bring a woman who has a fistula to be repaired, free of charge, and then we to take her back. So, I mean, these are the challenges we're, we're facing. So, coming now to that main question, from the time when I was teaching these girls who were born in refugee camps, to this minute, when we are communicating through the Internet, we have come a long way. But we still have a much longer way to go in quality, in quantity, in an equitable share, whatever is available for our people. And the only way we can do that is to educate more young people, give them an education that teaches them values, that teaches them respect and dignity, and teaches them, you know, don't do this, don't do that. Not because somebody's going to tap you on the knuckles, but because it's wrong. Stop cheating. Stop lying. Stop being lazy. Stop spitting. Stop fighting. Lose that weight, those habits that we have as children to develop into responsible adults mm -hmm. who can be trusted with the life of other human beings. To me, these are the values that are important to me. If I can continue to be a role model for the next generation beyond me, then my time on this planet would be worth it. And I am so blessed. Edna, it is so admirable. And just to put a number on the work that you have did, because I'm, I'm looking here, and this is an older article that describes that because of your hospital, because of what you are doing, Tens of thousands of babies have been delivered. 26,000. 26,000. Can we imagine 26,000 babies yeah. have been brought healthily into this world? How many uh, midwives have you trained? How many nurses and midwives have you trained through the through the hospital? Um, well, you know, I, I'm a crazy old woman. You know, I like to make 
plans and, and, and give myself targets. It gives me something to walk towards. And mm-hmm. when I started training, I said, Somaliland, we have a country that is as big as England and Wales together, land-wise. It's bigger than 18 countries in Africa, a population of 4 million, more populous than 19 countries in Africa. What is the proportion of health professions we need to take care of 4 million people living in a country of that size? And in my estimation, it was about a 1,000 midwives. And people said, what? You're crazy. You can't. We reached our target in 2018. Wow. Uh, now, the numbers are there. And we're discovering there are still areas, regions, uh, districts in different regions where they still do not have one single trained midwife. So mm-hmm. my estimation of 1,000, which was considered at that time as a, a non-achievable estimation is, I think, not as much as we, we needed. I think we need at least another five or six hundred, one and a half times as much as we have. And then we need to improve the quality. We need to raise the bar. We need to improve the competence. We need to develop their leadership. We need to develop their management. We need to develop their skills to cope with more complicated things. So building blocks like a pyramid. If you have the base, is wide, then you say, how many of those people can you teach a bit more? That many. Well, teach them. And how many more among those who you can teach even more? So this is what we're doing now. And my target is to develop a teacher training because it's developing the education that will improve standards. And of course... We did a survey. You always have to do a survey. I'm surrounded by schools in the neighborhood, five, six, seven big schools within a radius of two kilometers. And we went to each one, find out how many teachers do you have, how many students do you have. Uh, we have 1,500 students. Okay, how many teachers do you have? We have 35, we have 29. Okay, good. How many of them are female? And then look at each other and say, oh, we have uh, two. Oh, okay, two out of 35, okay. And what do they do? Oh, oh, they don't teach. One looks after the office and one looks after the uh, punctuality and stuff like that. So we are, again, at a time where women are being pushed out of the education. Mm -hmm. And I want to do two things. When you say, well, why, why, why don't you find school teachers? Why women are not becoming teachers? And the answer would be, what? I don't want my daughter to become a teacher. Don't you think my daughter could be something different or better? It made me realize that teaching is at the same level as nursing was in the 50s, when people would would tell my father, why are you allowing your daughter to study nursing? This is below your dignity. This is not you know, a job for a girl from a good family. Giving respectability to nursing is something that I have to continue to prove, continue to prove to this day. But nursing now is on the map. Midwifery is on the map. I'm not worried for it. I want to put teaching, school teaching, teachers on the map and give the profession of teaching that respectability and that importance in the hierarchy of jobs that it deserves to have and particularly give importance to female school teachers because they are the ones who will educate the children and teach them to give up all that childhood baggage and educate and behavior and and care and attention and, and all the things that a female teacher can give to a small child. So that is my current challenge. And the number of midwives we have is over 1,100. We have seven midwifery training schools and nursing training schools. Somaliland has now 31 universities. One of them is my university, the Edadi University. I have a medical school there. We have a dental school there. And last year, we were ranked the third from the top among the universities of Somaliland. And by the way, it's the only university that has been founded and that has been built by a woman. So to have wow. become a club 
I think is a good victory for women. And it's for all children. We have boys and girls. The majority are female, of course. 70% of my students are female. But then we also have boys. Yeah, I can imagine, Edna. And, but blessed, I mean, you have been working tirelessly on this. I think those 22 months of not being paid a salary <laughs> and just going back at it, and even, of course, before that point, being a first on so many levels, has given you the, the proper resilience to build and to continue building, which has been such a blessing and has had such an impact on so many people's lives and most probably will do for, you know, decades to come, if not longer. A personal question, Edna, what would your father say if he were to see all this, all this work that you've done? You know, he, he would probably say, that's good, that's good. And then he would find something that needs improvement and say, that's very good. And if you do that, it will be even better. Um, right. Something like that. It is incredible and it is amazing what you've done. And I've had the great privilege of visiting the hospital um, myself. I believe that was back in 2015. So it has yeah. been a while back. And I saw you also speaking to a group of newly graduated students. And you did it with such passion and such devotion to them, but also empowering them. I remember you, you talking to them, not too overwhelming, like, okay, here's what's waiting for you or, or whatever more, but really focused on the students taking their personal responsibility for their lives and for whatever comes next. And I thought that was such a strong way of doing it, uh, you know, talking to them like, okay, here's this piece of paper, but it's just the beginning of your journey and, and go out and make me proud and, you know, do more because you can. And I thought that was extremely inspiring how you did it in that specific setting. There was recently a book launch, I believe, late last year, which did very well. It was even one of the favorite readings uh, presented by the BBC. You've had quite some attention from international news media. Um, has it helped you at all in building the hospital and building the university? And what more can be done, for that matter, by the international community to help you? Yeah. Well, well, first of all, I wrote that book because I, I thought I, I owe it to the world. I owe it to women. I owe it to women in developing countries. And I, I felt that somebody should learn from my life, from the mistakes I made, from if I achieved anything, how. And maybe it's been a good life, but it hasn't always been good. I've had ups and downs and in between. I've been a prisoner of war, you know, a house arrest, political prisoner, whatever. So it, I just needed women to learn from that. It was published last year in August. By then the hospital was built, the university was built. And you have to come back, by the way, Aldo, because you have to see the new building of the university. Um, we'd like to come back when, when travel becomes possible again. The uh, book has linked me to people because it's published by Harper Collins. In, in the UK and the, and the British Commonwealth. They didn't have a right to sell it in America because they have different commercial sales, but I think Amazon sells it somewhere. So Canada has it, the rest of the world has it, America doesn't have it, and it's the property of HarperCollins. But I'm glad that I, I get some communications from, from different parts of the world. People send me email messages and uh, they compliment me and they, they, tell, they tell me how much I enjoyed it. And, and, and it tells the story of my people. It tells the story of my country. Mm -hmm. um, so if anybody can promote it and find it interesting, there's also the audio version is also available, which they allowed me to record. You know, if it sells, because 50% of the proceeds go to the hospital. Mm -hmm. um, the book is going to be, will help, hopefully, um, in time, if it becomes interesting. But I'm going to let you into a little secret. Uh, but it's, maybe you can equate it to counting your chickens before you even have eggs. <laughs> but uh, uh, I've been approached. Uh, tomorrow I'm talking to somebody who's going to see how they want to uh, write a television series of it. Oh, wow. So we want to discuss that. Whether we will agree or not, I don't know. What they have in mind, I have no idea. 
But um, there is this interest that is, just, and it's tomorrow. Tomorrow I'll be discussing that. So who knows? That's uh, wonderful. I mean, I think this is my personal opinion, regardless from the logistics around it, because I do appreciate that, you know, the hustle of publisher ownership and not being published in the United States versus United Kingdom and whatever more. I, I feel that should be resolved for, you know, a book with such a strong message by such a global example, because that's really what you are, Edna. What you've done is tremendous, and your story needs to be told to inspire people all over the world. And I feel strongly that that message should be pushed out left, right, and center. So whatever opportunity is out there, provided it, of course, takes good care of you and the hospital and the university, I feel you should take that. That's my opinion, you know, to, not only towards you personally, but towards the heritage of, of what you built and, and the vision that you've created. I mean, it is, again, it is admirable, as you said, like once you, you could have made the decision to retire somewhere quietly after so many years of service and so many travels and so many things that you've done, but you topped it up. <laughs> you chose to go back to your, your country of origin and improve the situation there, become a minister, build a hospital, build a university, and you're still doing that. So, so as you said, like instead of buying a yacht, you, you chose to do this and it shows and it's helped so many. So that is extremely admirable. We're almost at the end of this great interview, Edna. And so we always ask two questions at the end of each interview. And the first question is, what, if anything, you know, we've spoken so much about education and the role of women, women in East Africa, but women globally as well. But what, if anything, would you recommend as good reading for, you know, people to understand you better? You know, other than your own book, by the way. <laughs> but, but is there anything you would like to recommend to our readers, uh, to our listeners, sorry, for them to read? Uh, yes. You know, we all have role models and we all have heroes. My hero has been a, a woman who passed away a few months ago, Dr. Catherine Hamlin, who built the Fistula Hospital in Ethiopia and who died at age 93. And her book is called Hospital by the River mm -hmm. by Catherine Hamlin. Mm -hmm. It's uh, pretty much the struggles they went through. She, she's from New Zealand, by the way, and, and came with her husband to live in Ethiopia as you know, two young doctors. And that's, you know, where she, you know, remained for the rest of her life and built a hospital. And when I opened my hospital in 2002 and I started receiving women with, with, with obstetrical fistula, we didn't have the skills. We didn't know how to, what to do for these women. And Catherine sent me her deputy for one month to train my staff to operate on the women. We had 63 women needing operations for fistula. Can you imagine that? And to give me her deputy for a month and then trained 17 of my staff, two at a time, in her hospital, at her charge, at her expenses, and kept, you know, training two and sending them back and two again and sending them back. To me, that's all, if anybody ever deserved a Nobel, Catherine Hamlin is my hero, and her book is a beautiful book. Hospital by the River by Catherine Hamlin. That's a, that's a beautiful recommendation. Thank you so much. And then, of course, there is your book, so available on Amazon. It's called Perfect. A Woman of Firsts. If you go to Amazon, Edna Adam is my A Woman of Firsts, it comes up. Perfect. Thank you so much for talking us, not only through the book, but through your life, because, of course, the, the book is, is kind of bringing everything together. But the most important thing as we started this conversation is what do you do, right? It's not a tool for showcasing yourself. It's more you achieved a lot by doing is basically what I think. And, and that message should should come across, whether it's through a book, a television series or interview or, or whatever more. That's a beautiful thing. Um, then the last uh, question uh, that we ask each interviewee, Edna, Knowing now a little bit more about what we are trying to achieve as Teach Pitch with this podcast, talking about life skills, 
you having such insights in that. Who do you think would be a good next candidate for us to interview? Well, there's good people everywhere. Uh, of course, my world is around doctors. Today, I think one of the people I would interview is, again, I'm coming back to fistulas again, because it's, it's, it's a condition that really is worse than death. A uh, woman is leaking, a woman is, you know, things are coming out of parts of her body that she was, she's no longer in control of, urine and feces. That's the most humiliating condition for a, a woman. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, her name is Kate Grant. And she is the CEO, the executive director of the Fistula Foundation. She's a small, wiry woman. Mm-hmm. And as tough as they get. <laughs> and that's the kind of woman who has that tenacity and that determination and that drive. Tell her that I, you know, I sent you her way. But I think she is a woman who's also doing a great work in this world. There's millions of people doing wonderful, great work, but they didn't come into my life. Mm-hmm. Uh, but these women, Catherine Hamlin of the Fistula Hospital in Ethiopia, but she's gone. And Kate Grant is another great woman. Kate Grant. Kate Grant of the Fistula Foundation, who I'm sure thinks the same of you as you think of her, because she's the one who wrote that beautiful Huffington Post article Mm -hmm. about you and, and, you know, using extremely beautiful words, uh, justifiably so, to describe you, Edna. So, Great. We will definitely reach out to Kate and thank you for both your recommendations. This brings us to to the end of this podcast. Uh, Edna, I would like to thank you from the bottom of my heart for everything that you are doing, for the person that you are. You are genuinely a woman of firsts, and I hope that the world will find out more about you uh, if they do not know already. Thank you so much for taking the time up there in Hargeza to talk to us. Edna Adam, thank you very much. Thank you, Aldo, and invitation is still open to you to come back to us. Thank you. Bye-bye, everyone. Bye-bye. If you like this episode of the Teach Pitch podcast, then it would mean the absolute world if you could share it with your friends and or give it a short review on your preferred podcast platform. The more you share your ideas about these interviews the more people will find out about them. So do let us know what you think. We'd be very, very grateful. Special thanks to Kevin McLeod for our beautiful theme music, La Grande Chase. This podcast was produced and edited by Natalie Piles. Project coordination by Inva Cheney.